Happy New Year. Happy New Decade. My name is Joy Moore. You can read that in the bulletin. Uh, and uh, I am grateful to be here. Uh, I uh, teach. I, I came from Southern California back to the Midwest. I, I want some sympathy in telling, <laughs> telling you that. Um, so I am very grateful that Minnesota has had a mild winter so far. And every time it really snows, I've been able to leave the state. So I'm kind of working things out. I don't know if I can do this all season, but I'm batting a thousand so far. Um, but I'm very grateful. I just started teaching at Luther Seminary. And uh, I teach preaching, which I always hate to tell people before I preach. But uh, I um, don't ordinarily get to preach the first Sunday of the year. And so I'm very grateful. Uh, that uh, Pastor Greg has given me this opportunity uh, to come and to be with you on, on such a momentous uh, first Sunday of the year as we also are celebrating the first Sunday of the decade. So thank you for sharing your pulpit and uh, I'm grateful. Uh, you should know that uh, Pastor Greg found me in Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, because of a mutual somebody that knew him from uh, Ohio and um, um, made it possible for me to meet other United Methodists as I hang out with the Lutherans. So I'm very grateful to be home uh, as a United Methodist pastor. So thank you so much for receiving me. Now that's way more than you need to know about me. You gathered this morning to be reminded that we are part of a people of faith, of a God who has come down to know us, a God that hasn't given up on us. And so let us be in an attitude of worship and praise as we move into our gathering today. I wasn't uh, given any particular extra announcements. Is there something that the congregation needs to know this week that somebody wants to share? All right, you're on your own. God bless you. And may we now put ourselves in the attitude of worshiping God. Lord Jesus, our newborn Savior, as we celebrate the dawn of our salvation, be born anew among and within us. Fill us with awe and wonder of your redeeming love and the magnificence of your plan to save the world. Teach us to keep Christmas during this season of 12 days and throughout the year. Amen? Amen. Another gift that is newly opened. There are many unblemished days ahead of us. Jesus, our Emmanuel, 
goes before us into the unknown future. God is searching with us in every uncertain day and time. The light of God's presence will lead the way. We will walk by faith and not by sight. The splendor of Jesus Christ shines upon us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. the newborn Savior has come for us all. Sinners and saints, believers and doubters, brainiacs and simple, from here and there and everywhere, come one and all, the truly wise still seek him today. Follow the star that points the way to the Savior. Glory to God in the highest. Adore Jesus Christ, light of the world, Savior of the nations. Praise the Holy Spirit. My brothers and sisters, let us pray. By the brilliant light of a star, you led wise men on a long journey, a spiritual quest, to seek Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. As we enter into the promise of the new year, lead us by the light of your presence. Fill us anew with wonder and imagination this day, that we may seek you with all our hearts and walk into this new day and new year, brimming with confidence. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. From the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah. Arise, Jerusalem, let your light shine for all the nations to see, for the glory of the Lord is shining upon you. Darkness as black as night will cover all the nations of the earth, 
but the glory of the Lord will shine over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. Look and see, for everyone is coming home. Your sons are coming from distant lands. Your daughters will be carried home. Your eyes will shine and your hearts will thrill with joy. For merchants from around the world will come to you. They will bring you the wealth of many lands. Vast caravans of camels will converge on you. The camels of Midian and Ephraim. From Sheba they will bring gold and incense for the worship of the Lord. Here ends the first lesson. The choir has chosen a different song to sing this morning due to our relatively small numbers. So we won't be doing Make Room. Instead, we've chosen to do Love Came Down at Christmas, which I hear is Bernice Butcher's favorite song. who can stand, please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have seen his star as it arose and we have come to worship him. Herod was deeply disturbed by their question, as was all of Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading, of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law. Where did the prophets say the Messiah would be born? He asked them. In Bethlehem, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. O Bethlehem of Judea, you are not just a lowly village in Judea, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod sent a private message to the wise men, asking them to come see him. At this meeting, he learned 
the exact time when they first saw the star. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. Once again, the star appeared to them, guiding them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house where the child and his mother Mary were and fell down before him and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But when it was time to leave, they went home another way because God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Here ends the reading of the gospel. Thanks be to God. There's a question mark because I saw the children leave. Do they come back in? No? So no children's moment? Okay, okay. Just a second. Christmas is almost over. Sounds a little odd. But according to the liturgical calendar, we're at the 11th day of Christmas, with tomorrow Epiphany bringing the end of the Christmas season for the church. This is a particular opportunity for us to remember that in telling of the Christmas stories, we have this opportunity to share a story that is so familiar to us, we may miss the wonder, the majesty, and how incredible this story is. I love the Christmas season, and so I'm grateful that this story remains in this season. I love the Christmas season because in the midst of that season, we will suspend some of our criticism to be able to allow the story to fully be told. A story that is set in a time not unlike our time, and yet a time very different from our time. A time when those who followed stars were following in search of more than what it will mean for their lives individually. They followed a star because of its promise of joy to all the world. A story that begins in one telling the story of Luke that we are so familiar with. The story is told from Mary. And yet in Matthew, the story is told from Joseph's perspective. I love that the Bible makes sure that the story is told from every possible perspective. And yet the story continues to tell us one thing, that the light of the world that comes is a light that comes from God and that it can light up the darkness. This story is so familiar to you, I, I wish it weren't. Because of its familiarity, you already have pictures of the last children's performance of the Christmas story where Matthew and Luke are conflated and we have shepherds together with the wise men. I wish you could hear the story again for the first time to, to hear how jarring, how disturbing that story really is. And that its disturbance is not just for the people. 
but it is disturbing for the men who believe they have the most power in the world. You are thinking today is about the song that we just sung, the Three Kings from the Orient. I love that song, I'm glad we continue to sing it, and yet it has confused our imaginations to, to think that it's a story of three kings coming to find the king of kings. Consider how disturbing it would be for a gathering of the United Nations, all of the leaders from around the world, to come to a man who is known to be narcissistic and controlling, a man whose rise to power is not because he is Jewish, but because the Roman leaders wanted someone a favor in the seat of power in Judea. Herod. Herod we think of as being someone who is just to be hated because of the things that are recorded in scripture. But we know Herod because if you go to Israel today, you will still see the things that he built, the places of entertainment, the lands that were of his possession. Herod made a name for himself, a name that is still marked today. And Herod's concern for keeping a name for himself meant that he was so busy navel-gazing and making sure that the economy and the politics, the power and the finances suited him that he missed that he was king of the Jews, a people of promise, a people who had been told that God had not given up on humanity and that one day in the midst of strife and suffering that God would come and send a light into the darkness. And so, not the kings, not the leaders of the United Nations gathering to tell a narcissistic king that there was another king to be born. That, that would be scary. Can you imagine if the United Nations were to tell our president that he wasn't the most powerful person in America? I'll let you think about that. But that's not who came to see King Herod. And maybe it's a little self-serving for me to say it was more like an academic convention because they were wise men. They were the smart folks. They were the folks who had had a quest for all of their career. And they had taken a detour in reaching the answer to that quest. I find this part of the story a little disturbing. I, I wonder if you do. They had been following a star. They'd seen the star, and that had told them of this promised king. And so that star had brought them from, brought them from lands far away. And yet they did what was maybe the politically correct thing to do. They turned from looking at the star to look at the one in power. It was a good move if you wanted to be on the right side of Herod's history. It was a bad detour if you wanted to be on the right side of God's history. And so Herod has a big place in this story, not because of his hope, but because of his fear. The wise men paused from looking at the star to come to the king to ask, where is your king to be born? I know that's not how it reads, but you don't read the Greek or the Hebrew either, so I can translate it a little differently for you. Where is your king to be born? And that is disturbing, whether you are from the leaders of the nations or the academics. For the most powerful man in Judah to be told, another king is to be born. They understood coups. They understood leadership changes. And Herod, was not about to be upseated, unseated. And so Herod decided to let those who had been on this quest, who he knew would find the one they were searching for, he allowed them to go ahead and do what they were doing. He sent them on as if he too wanted to worship the king. He knew they would find this baby. They had come from afar. They were committed. And so they resumed their quest. They returned to seeking the one whose star had led them this far. And Herod followed them, not to worship the king, but in his efforts to destroy the king. 
and dreams are all around this story. Earlier, when we heard about Joseph for the first time, God spoke to him in a dream to tell him that the woman he was to marry, though her child was not his, was a promised son, and that he would raise this child as his own, but that the world would know that this is the very Son of God, in fact, God with us. 2,000 years later, we still tell that story. It was incredible for Joseph and Mary to hear, and it should remain incredible for us to hear. And those dreams, that hearing of the voice of God continued. And so while Herod was making plans to destroy all of the children under two years, to be sure that he wiped out this baby, Joseph was told, take your family, leave this place so that you will be safe. It says to me that God will not allow human arrogance to distort God's intention. It tells me that God will not allow people who think that they are powerful and smart to distort God's plan for good. It tells us that God's intention to set this world right cannot be compromised by human arrogance or human destruction. That's good news especially if you read the news this week, where we see again that death can come at the hand of the person who is said to be most powerful in the world. Why choose to kill if you already have the power? In church, as we move into this season, this is maybe the most important message to remember from this story. We kill because we doubt that we have power. We kill because we have placed our power in politics and in performance and in finances and in government. And we have taken our eyes away from God. We have turned away from the light of the world. We have been on a quest seeking the Savior. And yet when it almost looks like something good might happen for us, we'll do what is politically correct and set in motion what is the most destructive reality for women and children in the world. I don't know if you've ever doubted this portion of the story, story of Herod killing all of the babies. I used to think that maybe that was hyperbole, that maybe that was a way to get a story told for 2,000 years. But what's been going on the last few years as refugees to this country have found their babies' lives snuffed, their families separated, their hope that this would be a place of peace, a place of respite, removed from their imaginations. And instead, coming to America is just as bad as the reality that they were trying to leave. What is the response of the people of God? Like the wise men, we've taken our eyes off of the light of the world, and we put our hope for a moment in the kings of this world. But will we turn again to recognize that God's star is still leading? Will we turn again to say that what God is doing is so much greater than what government can do? Will we trust again that God has chosen to walk among us to suffer with us, to know our pain in order to give us again hope. And that God would do that, not by coming in grandiose power, that God by come, would come by giving up all to take on the form of humanity as we take on that form, as a baby. 
The wise men kept following that star and it brought them to the place where the baby lay. Not three kings, three gifts. We don't know how many came, but we know what they gave. Frankincense, myrrh, and gold. Doesn't mean a whole lot to us unless we really like to play with different smells. We still get the gold. But the reality is, is that was the riches back in those days. And it changes history for Joseph and his family. Who do you think a mere carpenter would be able to find a refugee in another community, in another country? How do you think that God was able to give Joseph and Mary, a poor couple, resources to live out their life, first in hiding, and then to raise the Son of God? These gifts, from however many wise men there were, were enough to start their life all over again, despite all that the king tried to remove from the society. In this new year, the church can remain in our divisions. We can continue to try to figure out who's in and who's out. We can continue to put our hope in government. We can continue to put our hope in power. Or we can trust the light of the world has come. We can believe again that God is doing something absolutely extraordinary, something that has to be told in a story because a single line will not hold on to it. And if you believe that, then you realize God will provide what is needed from the least likely sources. Academics from far away, if you just let them in your land. A baby who seems to have no power, except for he was raised to trust in the God who had promised his people that he would be with them always. So we still tell this story, an amazing story. One of my students told it this way. She said, these men followed a light in the sky. And as they followed, you could almost hear that star saying, I know where I'm sending you. I know the one who put me in this sky. I was there when he breathed onto humanity and gave them life. I was there when he rescued Israel from slavery. I was there when there needed to be light in the darkness. And I've been waiting for you for this moment to lead you once again to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's not going to come like you think, but if you're willing to listen for the voice of God, if you're willing to trust the ancient story, if you're willing to believe that the story will be told from women and men and from foreigners, if you're willing to recognize that the one who put me in the sky can use me to light up the darkness, then maybe you will have hope that the light of the world has come and he is inviting you to tell the same story, a story of how you are to be the light in the world. Light up the darkness, church. We're more than three kings, as much as we love this song. We are Christ-like, a baby who came to show us truth, a powerful man who could not snuff out God's love. We are the community because the wise men went home a different way. Amen. Will you stand and sing with me? Hymn 2, 54, verses 3 through 5.
I invite you to return to an attitude of prayer as we begin to remember not only the prayers that are in our hearts, but then the darkness of the world we live in and its need for the light of the world. Let us pray. Eternal God, light of the world, we pause to acknowledge our need for your presence and our confidence that you have kept your promise to be with us always. We gather in this space, O oh Lord, out of a holy habit to hear again your story and how you bring us into a place of hope to live into your promise. God, all around us is such brokenness. Around us is such need. Around us is such confusion. And we, O oh Lord, are disturbed. May our disturbance not be like King Herod's, where we would snuff out your light and keep our power. Let our disturbance be that there are not more like the wise men who come, came seeking your son. May our disturbance be that there are not more like Mary and Joseph who attune our ears to hear your still, small voice. May we be disturbed that the witness of the church is lost <coughs> as we spend more time fighting ourselves than in being a light in the world. God, hear our prayers for the needs in our lives, close to home, those who have lost loved ones as the year came to an end and as this new decade begins. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, for those who while the economy seems to be offering jobs, cannot find one that is fulfilling their quest in life. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, for those who thought that they had found a respite and instead had been rejected. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, for all those who are sick suffering. And hear our prayer, O oh Lord, for all those who, in spite of the news, in spite of their circumstances, in spite of their doubt, continue to seek you. As best as we know ourselves, O oh Lord, we desire that you would make us the star in the night that you would use us to be a light in the darkness, that we might truly be a city on a hill where people can see in this congregation what it means to be community, what it means to trust an old, old story and what it is to know that in the midst of despair, you have brought joy to the world. It is our confidence, O oh God, that this 2,000-year-old story is indeed our story. And as you called the wise men from afar, you call us to this place where we might again gather in your table and tell the story that says you are with us. This gives us hope. And that hope is not just for ourselves it is for the world. God, make us more identifying as your sons and daughters than even as Americans. For the light of the world has come in Christ.
The hope of the world is this promise you made to ancient Israel and have given to the church to tell the world. And as best as we know ourselves, oh God, we want to be those who tell of that great joy. In the name of Jesus, in the power of your Holy Spirit, and in the confidence of your almighty prayer, power, promises, we thank you, we seek you, and we will serve you. Amen. Amen. You know how you do offering? That was kind of a question. It, it's time for us to give our gifts to God. And I forgot to ask how the ushers come forward. So, oh, I see some plates. Will, the offer, will we offer our gifts to God in response to the gifts that God has indeed given us? Almighty God, these gifts first come from you, and so in confidence that you will provide from sources we least expect what is the equivalent of frankincense and myrrh and gold for the needs that we have as we follow your will. And so we offer these gifts that you might use them for the building of your kingdom. And we offer ourselves that you might use us as a light in the world. Amen. Amen.
Please. Um, we decoded the PowerPoint, and the responses will be sung to Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I'm really hoping that what I'm going to say is what he wrote. <laughs> Before we begin, I'd like to remind you, as I said in the sermon, that this is an old, old story. For all of you who gather together for Christmas with family or maybe for Thanksgiving over these, these few holidays to gather together with family, I know you told the stories of childhood and the stories of courtship and marriage and the story of loss. It's how we know whose family we are a part of. And this is the table that invites all to be at God's, in God's family. And so the most important thing we do is gather at this table and tell again this story as Christ invites to us all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and who seek to live in peace with one another. And so I invite us to confess our sin before God and one another. <coughs> Merciful God, that's not where you began. <laughs> Let me remind you, you know these words, but hear them again. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We've not done your will. We've broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. And we've not loved our neighbors. And we've not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty Father, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and by the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he broke bread. He gave thanks to you, and he 
and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Almighty God, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ and his offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ. One with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father. Amen. <laughs> children of God. Let us pray that prayer that joins us with followers of Christ around the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There's one loaf to remind us that we are one body, broken as Jesus offered himself to us. May we be nourished to offer ourselves to the world Christ died for. And the cup was a cup of suffering, and it became a cup of promise, forgiveness for all. Let us drink, remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us, that we might be seekers of how to be his light in the world. It's your practice to receive communion by intinction, and so I will offer you the bread, and you will dip in the cup. Um, I'm umming because I'm not yet a U University of Minnesota fan, um, but I am a United Methodist. And I'm trying to remember, I think you come through the center aisles and go to your right and left. <laughs> there we are, come through the center and return. 
And for those who would like gluten-free, we do have a gluten-free station as well. As you take your seats in preparation to receive, I invite the servers to come forward. It's not Fourth Avenue's table. It's not my table. It is your Father in Heaven's table because of His Son. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, come, brothers and sisters, and feast at what is a preview of the banquet when every nation, tongue, and tribe will know that Jesus, the light of the world, is Lord of all. Won't you come?
thank you, God, for these ordinary gifts of bread and wine in which you have displayed for us your extraordinary grace. May they fill us with your presence. And may the story that they remind us of empower us to be your light in the world. Use us to your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. dark, knowing that God is using you to be light in the darkness. And you don't have to worry. Just a little ray of light messes up all that darkness intends. So go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in the promise of the God who is with us. And go in the name of Jesus Christ, who understands our suffering and has promised to be with us always. We are the hope for the world because of Jesus. And my brothers and sisters, that is good news. Amen. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you.